we're going to look at the anatomy then of anterior and middle fossa. So we said we always want to have that see-through x-ray vision so that when we're looking from above, we uh, can look downward and see all of this anatomy below. Also, when we're working laterally, we want to have a view and a perception of what is medial. And when we're working medially, endoscopically or microsurgically, we want to have that x-ray vision that looks from medial toward the lateral side. And as we look through the skull base, anterior skull base, middle skull base, at below median anterior skull base, we see frontal sinus, ethmoid, sphenoid sinus, orbit below lateral anterior skull base. What arteries are these? This is anterior and posterior ethmoidal artery. We'll talk more about this anatomy later, but below the middle skull base laterally, we see what fossa? Temporal fossa with temporalis muscle. And then we come medially, we see Infratemporal fossa that opens medially into tergopalatine fossa. And then looking at all of this from laterally, we see clinoidal, oculomotor, supratrochlear, infratrochlear Parkinson triangle, and then anteromedial, anterolateral posterolateral, and posteromedial triangles. What nerve is this? Greater petrosal, and it is continuous with the Thidian nerve that's a very important landmark in endoscopic surgery. For a cup of coffee, what nerve is this? This is what? Lesser petrosal. What ganglion does it innervate? Otic. And what gland does it uh, uh, innervate then? Parotid gland. Um, but we always want to have that vision from below to above and above to below. Here is the co common approach that we'll use to anterior fossa, we've elevated a pericranial flap, temporalis muscle. Uh, commonly in approaching this area, we'll turn a bifrontal flap through the frontal sinus and then do a frontonasal osteotomy that will give us the area above and below the skull base. And these approaches can be limited or they can be very extended, extensive that go all the way from lateral orbital wall on one side to the opposite side uh, and gives you access to both orbits, anterior fossa, nasal cavity. And you always, we said, want to have that x-ray vision from above to below, and anteriorly we see frontal sinuses that can be very extensive. Behind that, ethmoid sinuses, and then sphenoid, and laterally, the orbit, so that we want to be able to deal with all of these areas from above. Uh, we have great access to orbit. Uh, 
you can fall into the sphenoid sinus from above and do a transcranial, transvenoidal approach. You have access to the roof of the cavernous sinus, not very good to the lateral wall, uh, but you want to have the see-through x-ray vision looking from above and have a good perception of all of this anatomy below the anterior fossa so that coming from above you can access much of this anatomy, pericranial flap, um, the orbits are freed up, medial canthal ligament, uh, that if you divide it, you, if you're dealing with extensive opening of the wall of the orbit, you want to reapproximate it at the end of the procedure or the globe can drift laterally. And here we've divided the medial canthal ligament, the nasolacrimal duct, and here we're looking at the Coming through the medial wall of the orbit is the anterior ethmoidal artery that's going to run across the cribriform plate. So these openings can be very extensive and we'll turn this into a uh, transcranial, transbasal procedure. Here we see the dura at the cribriform plate we can do an osteotomy around the cribriform plate. Here we're in back of frontal sinus into some of the ethmoid air cells. Uh, here we've done an osteotomy around the cribriform plate, but that usually doesn't lead to preservation of olfaction. What arteries are these? These are anterior ethmoidal. This artery running across the cribriform plate and eventually extending into the fox and possibly supplying falcine meningioma is an anterior ethmoidal artery. We have access to the sphenoid, to the nasal cavity, to the ethmoids, and as we open backward, we're into sphenoid sinus. Now running along the lower margin of the sphenoid sinus are arteries that arise from laterally from what arteries? These are sphenopalatine arteries that are branches of the maxillary arteries that run through the infratemporal and tergopalatine fossa. So these are just in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity here. Now we see the septated sphenoid sinus, the lateral limit of the exposure anteriorly are the optic nerves. Now what are these? What is that? What runs along the floor of the sphenoid sinus? Vidian nerves. They come forward to the vidian, the ganglion here, the tergopalatine ganglion in the fossa here in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. I must have done a thousand transvenoidal operations going to the cella before I realized that the vidian nerves run in the floor of the sphenoid sinus, often covered by bone in the floor, but they may be exposed, as in this case, directly under the mucosa and in the endoscopic procedure. They're great guides that lead us back to the terminal part of the petrous carotid artery. And here we've opened sphenoid sinus. Here are the vidian nerves that lead us back 
to the terminal part of the petrous carotid that blends upward into the cavernous carotid, and these arteries are in the lateral margin of the exposure. Uh, and here we've opened the clivus in this transcranial, transbasal exposure. And then we've opened the dura, we see vertebrals, basilar artery. What artery? Ica. What nerve? Sixth nerve. Uh, what nerve here that runs in the floor of the orbit in the roof of the maxillary sinus? V2 here. And here we're looking under the orbit in the lateral part of this exposure. Here is tergopalatine fossa, and this is maxillary sinus. So in transcranial, transbasal approach, you can access all of these areas. You have intradural access as well as extradural exposure in the transcranial, transbasal approaches. You have access to cella. Here we've opened the lamina terminalis, and you're looking all the way back then to the aqueduct. So now that's coming from above, but today with the endoscopic approaches, we need to understand access from below, and using the endoscope from below, we have access from cribriform plate even to frontal sinus, all the way down to the odontoid and the lower margin of C1 in these transnasal approaches. So you want to have the view from above, but you also want to develop that view from below upward. And if you look at the area below the skull base, we have nasal cavity in the midline that through the nasal cavity you have access from cribriform plate here below gyrus rectus all the way back to the cella and down the clivus. But laterally you have the maxillary sinuses. And so if you look at this, think about the endoscopic possibilities from the front using maxillary sinus and nasal cavity, you have access from lateral orbit all the way to contralateral lateral orbit. Coming through the back wall of the maxilla, you have access to what fossa here? What muscle is that? temporalis muscle, and then we go medially is what fossa? Infratemporal fossa. And then if we go into the tergopalatine fossa here, or at the back, through the back wall of the maxillary sinus, we have access to tergopalatine fossa in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And here we see the branches of maxillary artery coming on to the nasal septum. And an important step forward in endoscopic surgery has been these septal flaps hinged on branches of the maxillary artery so that above you have septum supplied by arteries here, these are branches of what artery? Ethmoidal arteries. Below here, septum supplied by maxillary, sphenopalatine branch of maxillary artery that supply most of the lower septum. And you can turn flaps in, mucosal flaps, that help you closing 
close up the skull base. So here we see the ethmoidal arteries that are branches of the, eth of the ophthalmic artery that passes above the optic nerve and then through the ethmoids to the falx cribriform plate and turn downward in the nose. And here we see these branches of the maxillary artery that come through the sphenopalatine foramen to the septum. And these arteries are fairly rich in supply that you can uh, hinge a flap on a turbinate or on the wall of the septum. Here we see a septal flap started, hinged on a branch of the maxillary artery. You can fill a large hole in the anterior fossa or fold it downward into the cliva. So this has been one of the significant step forward in expanding these endoscopic approaches to the skull base. We want to just take a few minutes now and build a skull base. And uh, I was walking on the beach uh, in Florida one day and came on this skull and someone said, this is a shark skull. Now, what kind of shark do you think that is? What sort of shark has a skull that looks like that? Anyone want to take a shot at that? For a cup of coffee? Um, what is that? What do you think? Anyone live in a beach community? Well, what kind of a shark has a Christagalli that the fox attaches to, has a middle turbinate attached to it, has a plate here that faces the orbit, and then has some air-filled Bulla, is that really a shark skull? What kind of bone is that? That's a human ethmoid bone. So now we'll build our skull base and we'll start at the center of the skull on the sphenoid bone that has a body that contains the sphenoid sinus and cella. a lesser wing, a greater wing, and what do we call this? That this is pterygoid process. Now, out in this area, what fossa is this? What attaches here? Temporalis muscle. So this is temporal fossa. And then there's an infratemporal crest and medial to it, below the greater wing, is what fossa? Infratemporal. And then it opens medially here in front of the pterygoid process. And what fossa is in this area? Is pterygopalatine, superior orbital fissure, what foramen is this? What comes through here? And the floor of the sphenoid sinus. Vidian canal for vidian nerve that enters pterygopalatine ganglion in the fossa. And this is foramen rotundum through which second division passes to enter pterygopalatine fossa. So that if we look here, just at this area, we see sphenoid sinus, cella, uh, 
and in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, we have what fossa? And entering the pterygopalatine fossa here is what nerve? Vidian nerve that enters the ganglion. And here, a little bit superior and lateral is foramen rotundum through which second division passes to enter the pterygopalatine fossa. So now, what bone is going to fit in this area? What backs up to the front of the sphenoid? Ethmoid bone that has cripperform plate, an orbital plate, uh, this lamina papricia here, that thin medial wall of the orbit, it's easy to get through it and get into the orbit when you're doing some of the endoscopic procedures through the ethmoid. Here we see perpendicular plate of the ethmoid that forms the upper part of the nasal septum. Now we're looking at ethmoids from above, cribriform plate. Do the air, ethmoid air cells open into the anterior fossa? What roofs the, anterior, the ethmoid air cells lateral to the cribriform plate? Is it actually open here under the dura? No, the frontal bone roofs the ethmoid air cells lateral to this ethmoidal notch where the cribriform plate sets. This is the view from below. Here's the view from above, and the cribriform plate fits in this area, and the ethmoid air cells are roofed by the frontal bone lateral to this ethmoidal notch. So we'll continue building the skull base, and we put frontal bone with sphenoid, we add in an ethmoid. The frontal bone forms the upper part of the orbital rim. What bone forms the medial part of the orbital rim and fits right here? What bone? I heard lacrima bone. Any other possibility? What about nasal bone? Yes? No? What about, what bone is this that attaches to the frontal bone here? Maxilla. The frontal process of the maxilla forms the medial part of the orbital rim as well as the lower part. The nasal bones are medial. The lacrimal bone is posteriorly. And this maxillary bone has a large cavity in it, a large sinus, through which if you open the maxilla, uh, if you go directly backwards, and open the back wall, you can enter pterygopalatine fossa. Uh, and here we see superior orbital fissure and foramen rotundum opening behind the maxilla into pterygopalatine fossa. The Vidian canal is a little medial. If you open the lateral wall, you enter this fossa, which is infratemporal fossa, and you can even open laterally and get into temporal fossa. You can also open the medial wall of the sinus and access the nasal cavity. So that if we look at back wall of maxillary sinus, and open it by directly behind it, we have 
Tergo Palatine Fossa, and V2, the terminal end of median nerve, Tergo Palatine Ganglion. If we open the lateral wall of the maxillary sinus, then we have access then to infratemporal fossa with pterygoid muscles, pterygoid venous plexus, branches of maxillary artery, plus branches of V3 below ovale. But endoscopically, we can access from planum all the way down to the odontoid using transnasal approaches. And if we work off in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and drill out this bone between V2 and V3, we can follow the vidian nerve backwards here on the petrous carotid. We can access anteromedial wall of cavernous sinus. Uh, so these are some of the possibilities. Here we see nasal cavity, back wall of ethmoids, and here we're looking through the back wall of the maxillary sinus. At what fossa? Tergopalatine, and this is V2 at rotundum, and here is on one side, that's the anterior end of Vidian canal, uh, and we can follow that nerve back in the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus to the terminal petrous carotid. But here we're looking from lateral orbit lateral wall of maxillary sinus. We've opened the sinus. If you open the back wall, we can access V2 in tergopalatine fossa. If we open it more lateral, we can access V3 and trigeminal nerve here in infratemporal fossa. So, uh, here's just a view inferolateral, and here is infratemporal crest on sphenoid bone. So, what fossa is this? Temporal fossa, and you see the temporal fossa opens into inferior orbital fissure. Uh, then medial to the infratemporal crest is infratemporal fossa here below the greater wing of sphenoid. It opens above through the uh, inferior orbital fissure. And then here is tergopalatine fossa between the back wall of the maxilla and the pterygoid process, and it opens upward into inferior orbital fissure. Uh, so this is just the view from below now. Uh, we're looking at back of maxillary sinus from below, infratemporal fossa, V3 branches entering infratemporal fossa, here is tergopalatine fossa, V2 at rotundum. And what nerve is this? Vidian that enters tergopalatine fossa. So that if you look at the cella from below, here we have Vidian nerve running along the floor of the sphenoid sinus and greater petrosal nerve on petrous carotid becoming vidian nerve entering tergopalatine fossa and then second division entering tergopalatine fossa
And if you're in the lateral wall of the transphenoidal exposure, and you drill out this bone in the lateral wing of the sphenoid sinus between rotundum and ovale, just taking that little bit of bone gives you anteromedial access to the medial part of cavernous sinus. So this is some of the anatomic basis of the endoscopic approaches. Well, we add in a zygomatic bone. We complete this orbit, and I won't talk a lot about this, but we need to move on. And now, what bone is this? This is an important bone in the endoscopic approaches. This is what bone? Palatine bone. Uh, it has a perpendicular and a horizontal plate. It, the plates fit together like this to complete the posterior part of the hard palate. The perpendicular part forms the medial wall of the tergopalatine fossa. And what attaches here below this sphenopalatine foramen that is in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity? That's the attachment of the posterior part of the middle turbinate. Here's the attachment of the posterior part of the inferior turbinate. And here there's a orbital process of the palatine bone that forms a small part of the floor of the orbit. This part, the sphenoid process, joins the lower part of the sphenoid bone below the sinus. And here's the sphenopalatine foramen through which the branches of the maxillary artery pass in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity to supply the turbinates and the nasal septum. And that foramen is just above the posterior attachment of the middle turbinate. So here we see palatine bone forming medial wall of pterygopalatine foramen. This is what nerve passing forward? V2 and coming from infratemporal and pterygopalatine Fossa is a branch of the maxillary artery then that supplies the nasal cavity. So the bones fit together something like this. Maxilla, medial wall of tergopalatine fossa formed by palatine bone, and then back posteriorly sphenoid bone. Now, what is this terrible looking bone? Is that a fish? That's inferior turbinate, which is its own bone. And we look at sphenoid bone now from above. We see the planum, and then between the optic canals, the chiasmatic sulcus that has an anterior limbus and a posterior limbus uh, with the optic canals laterally. And is the tuberculum on the anterior limbus or the posterior limbus of the chiasmatic sulcus? Well, it's on that posterior limbus actually down almost in the anterior wall of the cella, so that tuberculum meningiomas arise here, not at the back edge of the planum, but actually around the corner below the anterior limbus, along this posterior limbus. And if you're going to devascularize a tuberculum meningioma uh, 
why you need to get around the corner from the plenum almost down in the anterior wall of the cella. And what is this prominence? That's a middle clinoid that can sometimes ossify over to the anterior clinoid um, and complete a bony ring around the carotid at the roof of the cavernous sinus. Laterally, we're looking at foramen ovale in the roof of the infratemporal fossa. So nasal septum is formed above by what bone is this? Ethmoid, below by vomer, and anteriorly there's nasal septal cartilage. As you look back into the nasal cavity, what foramen is this? Right here. This is sphenoid ostea. This is sphenopalatine foramen between the sphenoid and orbital process of the palatine bone. And this is where the maxillary artery comes into the nasal cavity. So nasal septum is formed above by perpendicular plate of ethmoid, below by vomer, anteriorly by nasal septal cartilage. Uh, here we see a vomer, and uh, we look now across the maxillary bone. We see the vomer, the perpendicular plate, and looking at the sphenoid bone from posteriorly, what is this opening? This is the opening for the Vidian Canal at the back edge of the sphenoid, and it runs along the floor of the sphenoid. Uh, here we now will fit in what bone fits here on the back of the sphenoid, an occipital bone, we add in the temporal bones. We see skull base here from above, from below. Now, have we missed any bones in the skull base? We missed three, malleus, incus, stapes. And we talked about those yesterday. So we've looked at skull base above and below. 